Okay, so we, we've got more or less, most people um, have joined us, so we'll, we'll make a start. So thank you, um, everyone, for coming. This is our second online conference in a series we are producing um, on pertinent topics for the built environment. Um, just a few housekeeping um, and things. You are on um, mute. However, your comments, your feedback is so important to us. And if you submit questions, thoughts, any ideas that you have in the comments um, box, our um, co-presenter, Stephen Fox, will um, feed those questions after each presentation. Now, your host today um, is my, myself, Pauline Trato. Um, I'm working um, with the University Campus of St Albans, um, which is a joint venture between the University of Hertfordshire and Auckland's College, which is fundamentally um, been set up to deliver part-time education programmes. And UXA has a, a, a high reputation um, for bridging the gap between academia and industry. So without further ado, um, as I say, my name is Pauline Trato. Um, I've been in the construction industry for some 23 years now. I was previously executive director at BRE and today I'm running my own consultancy, helping companies in construction commercialize and embrace the digital um, world. So our topic today, we are obviously piggybacking on the Prime Minister's um, statement, which was build better, build faster and build greener. Yes, we know we have a housing crisis. Um, we know there's lots to do. There's, there's lots of initiatives, lots of programs, a lot of good intent. They're putting money towards all of this, but we ask ourselves, is the investment to upgrade buildings and build zero carbon homes enough to reset our construction industry? And today we bring you some key speakers from Morgan Sindel, the Construction Innovation Hub at BRE, Wilmot Dixon, the UKGBC and Ilka Homes, who are all undertaking huge um, initiatives to address and help us towards the government's net zero carbon targets. So without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce Richard Twin. He is a senior manager at um, the UK Green Building Council. Um, Richard has been with the UK GBC now for some nine years and he's highly involved in developing and supporting and influencing policy. And Richard is going to um, be discussing, you know, is, a, is, is, a, is there adequate policy in place to ensure the, the millions that government are investing into clean growth um, going to be successful? So without further ado, um, I am going to bring in Richard. Okay. My... Yes, yeah, thank you very much, Pauline. Um, so uh, can you see, see my screen sharing just to make sure before I start? Okay, fantastic. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for, for uh, joining such an early start. Um, so uh, I'm going to kick us off just with a quick run through of some of the uh, policy context around uh, achieving a net zero carbon built environment. Um, as Pauline said, I'm a uh, senior manager um, for advancing net zero at the UK Green Building Council. Um, just a bit of context uh, of uh, who uh, UK GBC are, if you aren't aware of us already. So um, we're a membership organization for um, businesses from across the built environment value chain. Um, basically working together to try and improve the sustainability of the built environment. That includes carbon and energy, but also nature and biodiversity, waste and resources, social value and health and well-being as well. But specifically on uh, carbon, which uh, we're here to talk about today, um, we are part of uh, a global campaign um, being run by the World Green Building Council called Advancing Net Zero. 
um, which was set up in the wake of the Paris Agreement a few years ago. Um, it was set up specifically to say, well, what is the built environment contribution towards that agreement? Um, and the headline is, well, we need a net zero carbon built environment globally by 2050. And that means all buildings, new and existing, will need to achieve net zero for operational and embodied carbon by 2050. Um, the campaign also set uh, interim target um, that by 2030, all new buildings should operate at net zero carbon and should use 40% less embodied carbon. So we need to be getting started uh, on this as soon as possible. Now in the UK, uh, UK GBC has been uh, working on this for the past few years um, and uh, to try and help drive that transition in the UK, we launched our net zero carbon building framework uh, last year. This was all about trying to come up with a consistent definition for net zero carbon and a consistent way that people can work towards outcomes. Uh, so we're not talking about um, building models, we need to be talking about actual performance and actual data. Um, as you can see from the list of supporter organisations though, this is very much uh, an industry-led initiative. Uh, this is about businesses going away and saying, well, this is the right thing that we need to be doing. Government has been slightly slower on the uptake, shall we say. So um, I'm going to uh, just very briefly run through um, some of the key areas um, uh, of policy related to uh, uh, net zero carbon buildings um, and just sort of assess where we are up to. So we're going to start with the big one. Um, home retrofit. Uh, this is uh, just in magnitude terms uh, the largest built environment uh, impact. Um, so uh, the energy used in our homes accounts for roughly 20% of the UK's uh, annual carbon emissions. In terms of what we need to do as a headline objective, um, basically we need to convert all of our 29 million homes over to zero carbon heat by 2050. Sounds very daunting and yes it is. Uh, that includes not only new heating systems, but also significant investment in energy efficiency as well to make them work properly. The clean growth strategy from a few years ago also set out um, a target for 2035 that all homes where practical should try to achieve ETC band C. Now, how are we doing towards that? Well, uh, we have a few things uh, at the moment. Um, you'll see that from this list of policies, those in black, are those policies that we actually have already or, or are, in the, um, are in the process of being implemented. Those in grey are promises uh, and proposals. Um, we of course have the Green Homes Grant at the moment. Uh, it's brilliant to get uh, a large slug of money, £2 billion to invest in retrofit. Um, the problem is that it's only for the next year. Uh, and it's due to close down in 2021. Um, it's been estimated that in order to achieve the 2035 target of ECC Band C, we will need that level of public investment annually every year between now and 2035. So we can't just afford to throw a bit of money at it and expect that that's going to solve things. On top of that public investment, we probably need double that again in private householder investment. So owner occupiers investing their own money in order to achieve that 2035 target. We're talking at around 75 billion worth of total investment. So that is a daunting challenge and we don't really have sight of how we're going to be achieving that just yet. We also have the energy company obligation. Uh, this is for fuel poor. Um, uh, uh, households predominantly um, and generally cheaper measures um, but we're only talking uh, around 600 million pounds a year which um, in the grand scheme of things is a bit of a drop in the ocean. Beyond that we have things like the Cle uh, Clean Heat Grant uh, so this is, will be the replacement of the renewable heat incentive um, but again it's another short-term grant mechanism. Uh, it's throwing some money up front. It's not necessarily providing uh, long-term investment. Looking a bit further though, there, are, um, there will hopefully be a consultation on tightening minimum energy efficiency standards, that's that uh, MEES acronym, uh, for privately rented properties up to band C by 2030. There's currently a regulation in for E, um, but it's not being enforced. Um, if that's going to work properly, it needs to be properly enforced. Uh, and finally, 
government is making green mortgage pilots uh, at the moment. There are proposals banding about about whether you could require mortgage lenders perhaps to try and invest uh, to improve the energy efficiency of their portfolio. But that is still incredibly early days. So we've got a lot of work to do here. Moving on then to uh, non-domestic. Um, so um, uh, the, this roughly accounts for about 10% uh, uh, of the uh, UK's emissions in terms of uh, operational impacts. Um, similar sort of story with this one. Um, we need to convert all of our non-domestic buildings over to zero carbon heat by 2050. The clean growth strategy also included a target uh, to uh, improve business energy productivity by 20% by 2030. So again, we can't just be leaving this um, for the last minute. Now, uh, we do actually have quite a lot of policies in this space, but none of them are necessarily going to drive the scale of change that we need. Um, that list of acronyms, streamlined energy and carbon reporting, greenhouse gas reporting, uh, energy saving opportunity schemes, there are a lot of requirements on businesses to report their emissions and their energy use, um, but not necessarily to make uh, improvements. Um, there is also the uh, EU emissions trading scheme, which impacts some uh, industry and climate change agreements. Um, hopefully that will roll over um, after Brexit into a UK-based scheme, uh, but we still need to see the details. Beyond that, though, we're quite light. Um, there is, of course, clean heat grant, but that's only for small installations. Um, minimum energy efficiency standards. We did have a consultation last year that for commercial properties it would be raised to band B by 2030. We still haven't had the outcome of that consultation yet. So that's still a little bit in the balance. And the last one, mandatory operational energy ratings. Uh, some of you may recall the display energy certificate discussions from a few years ago. Um, this is coming back round again because I think the government has realized it's a complete no brainer. So hopefully there should be some sort of consultation proposals on that later this year. So moving from retrofit onto uh, new build and building regulations um, in particular, um, slightly harder to pin down what we need to do here, but the Committee on Climate Change was quite clear um, last year what we should be doing, particularly with regard to new homes. They said that by 2025, we should be ensuring that uh, new homes are built that limit their heating demand to only 15 to 20 kilowatt hour per meter squared per year. Very technical term, but broadly that is roughly equivalent to passive health level. They also said we should be talking about low carbon heating. Uh, that needs to be standard by then, and we need to be taking measures to el eliminate the performance gap. Um, and we're not doing well here at all, unfortunately. Uh, so there was a consultation on the future home standard towards the end of last year proposals to in, uh, um, increase cartel uh, by 31% this year. Um, we don't know where, the, where that's got to now. Uh, it's looking unlikely that will be implemented this year. Uh, it, it's looking somewhat uncertain. Looking out to 2025, um, the proposal is around a 75 to 80% carbon reduction, although the detail beyond that is very sketchy. Um, commitment to low carbon heating, which is good, but we're not yet talking about those sort of passive house levels that, that the Committee on Climate Change were recommending. And finally, last part of this whistle-stop tour of uh, policy, uh, the um, construction industry's dirty little secret, embodied carbon. Um, uh, these charts on the right taken from uh, the RIC, um whole life carbon um, uh, assessment for built environment. Um, as you can see, in some circumstances, the upfront embodied carbon um, for buildings can account for half of the life cycle impacts. And those are impacts which happen today, um, which in climate terms uh, have a much more significant impact than emissions which will happen later down the line. The World Green Building Council uh, has set out some targets around this. So we need to be reducing the upfront embodied carbon, everything up to practical completion um, by 40% by 2030. Um, and we need to be achieving net zero embodied carbon by 2050. Um, that is a massive challenge and the policies are virtually non-existent at the moment. Um, with the exception of product standards, 
uh, which are mostly being driven by the EU at the moment. Um, you have to go all the way down to city level to find anyone that's actually doing anything on this uh, at the uh, um, legislative level. So the Greater London Authority has introduced requirements for whole life carbon assessments of May of uh, referable schemes as of this year. Um, Bristol, Greater Manchester and West Midlands have plans uh, to do something similar soon. But we're still just talking about assessments. Um, that is my bullet point um, at the end there. Um, when are we going to start talking about embodied carbon targets in planning and building regulations? Because we've got an awful lot of work to do uh, and no real policy mechanism to do it at the moment. So I will uh, leave you with that thought. Um, and you can find out an awful lot more about our Advancing Net Zero uh, program uh, on our website. Thank you very much. Hello, Richard. Yes. I yes. have one question for you. Ah, right. Um, and it's a nice question. I'll read it out to you. As a homeowner of a leaky 1940s house with a concrete floor, old double glazing and ancient cavity wall installation, I simply can't afford to retrofit energy efficient measures currently. Any advice? Um, it's a very good question. And to be honest, I'm just in the process of trying to buy a Victorian terrace house at the moment and uh, scaring myself silly with what, what, what would need to be done to it. Um, the, the, the first place to look is, is at the Green, Home Gr Green Homes Grant at the moment uh, to see what kind of uh, support could be provided through that. That is mainly focused around uh, wall insulation. There is some support for uh, things like low carbon heat. Um, but the, the sort of place to start with that is getting a very good assessment done. Um, so uh, there are um, PAS 2030 requirements around getting uh, assessments. Um, I would have a look at whether there are uh, people like Retrofit Works um, uh, operating in your local area. So it's a cooperative of installers. Um, who tend to do much more detailed assessments of what's actually needed. You probably don't want to be going directly to installers because they're just going to sell you what they install. Okay. Um, so have a look at what kind of assessments can be done and whether you can get some money out of the Green Homes Grant for now. Thank, thank you for your advice for um, that comment. I'll pass you back to Pauline. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. So our next speaker today is Nigel Banks. Nigel is the Special Product Projects Director at Ilka Homes. Nigel's led the development of the Ilka Homes concept and gained the first NHBC system approval for a modular housing product. That's pretty impressive. He is now developing a number of new market opportunities and manages Ilka Homes pioneering R&D projects. Nigel is also a member of SIPSI and he's a chartered engineer. And today, Nigel's going to present, will offsite construction enable industry to build affordable and sustainable homes? Nigel, over to you. Thank you, Pauline. So yeah, I'm going to try and tackle the question of affordability and, and sustainability and the role that offsite construction can play. Clearly, we're an offsite manufacturer, so you may be able to guess where my thoughts may be going around this, this topic. But clearly, one of the, the biggest big challenges we have around affordability is the supply of housing. And um, while demand outweighs supply, as we've seen for particularly people in, you know, looking for family housing with gardens at the moment, the house prices go up despite a difficult uh, uh, economic context. So this chart just comes from the latest um, new build dwelling statistics. We are building more homes since the last um, recession 2009, um, but we've still got a long way to go to get the 300,000 homes a year that the government is targeting by mid 2020s, and we need to increase supply. So one of the things that we do at Ilka Homes is uh, manufacture homes in a offsite manufacturing environment. And we don't bring people, trade people off build construction sites into a factory. We are training people up from very varied sectors, people working previously in call centers and in bars and in uh, restaurants and in shops. And we're training those up to, to now be 
manufacturing homes. So we have a very large facility. I normally play a video, and there's a link to the video there. If you want to see the video, we've got a big factory up in Yorkshire, uh, where we uh, manufacture our homes, full digital design. Um, embodied carbon is, is, is lower than traditional construction, but not quite 40% yet. So that's something we are looking at. Uh, and a big focus on engaging a more diverse workforce. So we, we have uh, six production lines, manufacturing manufacturing homes with automation on the front end of, of the line, but still a relatively uh, traditional uh, manual process towards the end of the line in, in, in delivering finishes that people would expect to see. Our homes are then transported to the construction site um, as completed modules finished inside and out and then transported, typically installing, installed on a, uh, on a mobile crane, typically at a rate of around two to six homes a day. Um, and we have about a week or two's worth of work to complete the homes uh, in order to, to hand them over to the customer. So a much faster construction process. So this is about building more and building faster. Uh, clearly a big process, big factor of what we're talking about today is can we deliver at a higher standard and our homes meet what we expect to be the future home standard for 2021 as standard. We have a fairly straightforward upgrade to deliver the, the 2025 standard and uh, beyond the net zero, uh, which the Great London Authority are requiring in their London plan. So we, we, have, we do look at and we have measured our embodied carbon footprint and, our, and have made strides towards that, but have further work to go in that space. One of the benefits of site construction is the impact locally to the construction site particularly important where you're building in brownfield sites adjacent to existing homes and communities is to reduce noise, dust, uh, pollution and uh, vehicle visits to the site. We have a, 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 a very high fabric standard as standard, exceeds building regulations by about 20% and a big focus on, on waste in the factory with an off-site manufacturing process where we can precision engineer parts and, and, and order parts to size. Uh, and also close the loop on some of our uh, waste processes and, and divert those back to the original manufacturer to be re uh, reintroduced back into their new products. So a real focus on end-to-end on -end sustainability in our products. Um, as, uh, as Richard alluded to, that the, the Committee on Climate Change report on, on zero carbon really does push to, to, towards some really high aspirations. And the one to focus on, I think, is around low carbon heating. And the reason I think that's uh, a real important thing for housing is it, it's looking like it's gonna push us towards all electric heating from, um, from 2025 and potentially from 2021 when the new Partel is released because the gas grid won't be around and that's the only option uh, towards um, zero carbon heating or very low carbon heating we have. And one of the really interesting things that came out this summer was the, um, National Grid's future energy scenarios, which points towards some solutions towards that net zero uh, um, target that, that Richard was referring to. Um, the low societal change doesn't allow us to get to net zero. You either need a hydrogen grid or electric heating and electric uh, cooking um, and high energy efficiency to get there. And the good news is we're, we're well on that, on that way to, the, to a zero carbon national grid. Um, two and a half years, well, sorry, eight years ago, the grid was two and a half times as carbon intense as gas. On a, uh, on a kilowatt hour basis, but it's already down below, below that level now and it's projected in these scenarios to get to a negative uh, carbon uh, grid by 2035 uh, or even potentially by 2030, which is really exciting. And when you look at using heat pumps, we're already well below, 75% below when you use a heat pump, uh, the emissions from natural gas, and again, potentially going to zero and negative by 20, uh, 2030s. So some really exciting opportunities and that essentially is an exciting opportunity in terms of what, what needs to be done in existing homes as well. And, and a significant lifetime saving, if we don't do that now, we continue but using gas boilers, that's, that's a, a challenge that we face in, in current building regulations, not keeping up with, with where the grid has got to in the last eight years. So what, what have we been doing and some of the, some of the technologies and, and solutions we've adopted? These are the very first homes we built back in 2017 as a business. Mm. Um, net, net zero, um, all electric homes uh, with a MVHR solar PV battery storage. Oh, it's a mute some other people. Um, and uh, also electric vehicle charging, which is going to be an important part of um, getting people to a, to a zero carbon lifestyle, not just a zero carbon home. Um, 
and some really good data came out of that. Those homes performed to net zero as well. The next scheme, which uh, we did the next next year in 2018, was with uh, Home Group and NG. And this is a really interesting scheme because they've trialled six or seven different offsite solutions, three or four different electric heating schemes. We're monitoring it with the BRE and hopefully we'll get some really interesting outcomes in terms of the performance data that those homes achieved. Um, and again, we, we deliver those homes and completed our homes before most of the other forms of construction were out of the ground and finished their foundation. So really demonstrate the speed of construction that we were able to achieve. We've also been working with some small developers, some SME developers, and these homes were built to co-level five. Uh, as people remember the COVID stable homes when we, when we had that uh, and being used at scale. Um, on, for, on a very small site, um, real, real focus on fabric performance, water efficiency as well. Uh, and PV to get to, to, to zero carbon. But the homes which uh, we've delivered this year are the ones which we're uh, are most excited about, um, which move to, towards an air source heat pump solution in a much more cost effective way, solar PV on roof, delivered in a, in a tight garage site in, in Greenwich um, to, the, to the London plan, so achieving full net zero on site without needing offsets, um, and some fantastic homes delivering uh, in an area which is in desperate need of, of additional housing. Um, and those are the sorts of solutions we, we see adopting going forward. And it's an area we're now looking at where can we really integrate some of those technologies into a more aesthetically pleasing uh, solution and driving um, some uh, and integrating those technologies so they're less visible and easier to use and easier to operate with the customer with more smart controls and, and linking to agile heat tariffs. We think that's a real exciting future and a, an interesting way in which we may be able to fund some of these benefits and savings in the future. Uh, and those those designs we put forward won a, a reader competition in the Sunday Times and we're really excited to see where those uh, schemes go as we start to plot and develop those products. And that was it. So hopefully yeah, and we think we can deliver affordably and sustainably and, and feel off site as a role in, in really driving that agenda. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, I have one comment here, and I'm just conscious of time, but one important comment. Clearly, there's a key role um, that um, Offsite can play um, in, in this agenda. It's a massive role. But what do you think is the, the barrier, the main barrier to Offsite um, um, being fully uh, adopted uh, for new, new house building? I think that the, the biggest challenge that we found is, uh, is, is it, it's an expensive process to get started. Uh, investing in a, in a typical car plant would, would invest about 500 million pounds to set up a car plant. And there's very few construction companies that are willing to invest significant volumes in money in investing in, 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 in new factories. So there is a high startup cost, and that is a cost that people need to, to bear and get investment towards. I think that's, that's, a, that's a barrier to entry for new people. And then the, the next challenge is around securing your own pipeline. And a lot of the work we're doing is around now securing sites ourselves as well as working in partnership with housing associations, local authorities, and Homes England to build a, a strong pipeline of work because a factory needs a steady flow of, of, of pipeline or schemes going through that. So those are the two, two big areas to, to focus on. Thank you. I'm as conscious of time, so I'll hand you back to Pauline at this point, yeah? Thank you. Okay. So um, our next presenter is a gentleman called James Gale. James is the Senior Technical Manager at Morgan Sindel. Um, previous to that, James was the Building Services Manager at Gallifer Tri. So he comes uh, with a wealth of background and experience. Um, as many of you know, the Morgan Sindel Group is um, one of the leading UK construction and um, regeneration groups um, and, and is growing vastly. Um, and it currently employs six and a half thousand people operating both the public and commercial sectors. So um, may I, ladies and gentlemen, introduce you to James Gale. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, James. And I'm just going to bring up your slides. Um, apologies, this is technical issue <laughs> nonetheless on the mornings. I'm just trying to share my screen. With you. Do, do you want me to do that? There we go, okay. ladies and gentlemen. Over to James. Good morning, everybody. Um, 
I'm not here uh, to uh, present to you this morning about actually how we're achieving low carbon. Uh, we are doing low carbon and, and zero carbon on a number of projects. But one of the things I wanted to actually uh, emphasize was actually our route to low carbon, uh, and that's within mainstream budgets. That's not where you know, people are throwing lots and lots of money to achieve uh, zero carbon. Um, there is lots and lots of elements that, that drive this, but um, actually maintaining budgets and keeping within those budgets is actually what's going to make this feasible for the government to achieve. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, what is clean growth? Uh, so essentially what you've heard um, from, um, from Richard's uh, presentation this morning, obviously there is some uh, key drivers here uh, that are the, uh, the governments uh, and are obviously uh, replicated in, in many public bodies. Uh, and these are obviously targets, uh, and you know, they have, they're all tangible targets. But again, from a commercial sector, um, we believe we need to make sure that there is probably more detail around those, uh, which is why one of the things that we've been uh, setting ourselves uh, as individual targets is to actually improve on these and see if we can't get there faster. If we go to the next slide. Sorry, they take a long time to, to all fall in those uh, arrows. Right. Uh, so, uh, as you can see, Morgan Tyndall take the environment incredibly seriously, um, which is why uh, we're proud to obviously be one of the founding members of the UK Contractors Declare Emergency. Um, on top of that, we've been uh, reviewing our own internal carbon emissions for uh, over seven years now, and it's an aspect that drives us um, to be more sustainable, not just in the projects, but also how we deliver them. If you go to the next slide. So clean growth, um, uh, especially in construction. One of the key things that um, Richard obviously uh, identified within his presentation was the uh, monitoring and reducing the um, uh, embodied carbon. And at the moment, there is very little uh, measurement, um, reporting associated with that. We recognize that we need to do more. Uh, so we've developed our own carbon tracking uh, calculation and tools. And rather than just run this on projects that you know, we think are going to be low carbon or going to be zero carbon, we're going to run this on all projects going forwards. Uh, and this will give us a really, really good uh, idea of exactly where embodied carbon is sat and what elements we can then do to uh, promote that uh, and develop it. Uh, the next is obviously the, uh, it will give us a better understanding of the entire um, cradle to grave and life cycle of a product. Uh, and that's going to allow us to improve uh, the elements that we actually build into our, our construction projects. And, and one of the things that we're doing at the moment is um, you, you see obviously there, there's a huge great target to achieve by 2030 and by 2050. Um, and one of the things we're doing isn't perhaps looking for the big elements that we can just jump in and throw things at projects. Uh, we're actually using a manufacturing term which is uh, Kaizen, which is it's small improvements and it's done on a continuous basis. And that way we can actually look at the projects that we're doing now and work out what elements we can improve on those projects uh, to drive them towards those 2030 and 2050 targets. Um, one of the small, um, uh, the small steps that we're, we're taking at this moment has been obviously the um, improvement in uh, fabric and envelope um, first. Um, you know, we need to make sure that the actual uh, envelope is a, of any building is, is as uh, sustainable as it possibly can be um, and, and we've been working with a lot of uh, mainstream uh, supply chain manufacturers to actually uh, develop different products with them that will kind of set new targets and, and drive our improved performance uh, and one of the things we've used is obviously the uh, Letty which is the uh, uh, the, 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 the London um, oh, the London uh, energy uh, transformation initiative uh, guidance for, for energy targets. And we've actually set ourselves up improving on those just through um, fabric performance at this moment in time. Uh, the other thing that we've also been doing is working with a number of uh, other manufacturers uh, to actually look at um, better air source heat pumps. And so we're looking at uh, hybrid solutions at this moment in time. Uh, we're looking at uh, internal planting solutions. Uh, we're looking at sequestered carbon solutions. Uh, and we're also looking at kinder gases um, for you know, mainstream cooling uh, because a lot of our commercial buildings are still going to require that. 
Um, ultimately, um, development of more sustainable materials and products is going to be one of the most, it is the most important way that we are from construction industry, both domestic and commercial, going to achieve 20, 30 and 2050 targets. If we go to the next slide. So how does clean, clean growth work? Um, as you can see, obviously, embodied carbon is, is a, a, a oh. <laughs> can, you go, can you go back? Thank you very much. Uh, embodied carbon is, is going to be key and research into understanding exactly where that embodied carbon sits and the percentages. Um, construction as a general, we're, we're not the best at this at this moment in time, uh, and it's something that we recognize we've got to improve on. Um, that's going to be key. And again, it's part of what drives us to develop our own uh, carbon measurement and carbon calculation strategy. Uh, but we are considering these things. Uh, so at the moment, uh, we are using a number of CLT and SIP systems, and obviously that's cross laminate timber and structurally insulated panels. Uh, and these are timber, so they effectively have a, an awful lot of embodied carbon. Um, but it's not just um, using those materials correctly now that will help this. It's also looking at what those materials are going to do in the future. And one of the things we've been discussing with manufacturers is that 60 years down the line, what will we do with these materials? You know, we don't want to send them to landfill. We don't want to burn them. Um, and so we're looking at methods at this moment in time that actually the materials that are going into our buildings could be pulped down and reused back into a construction product um, so that effectively there is no end of life for those products. They will continually be reused. And I think that's one of the key elements that is going to make this this work and it's not just on you know timber based materials we need to start thinking more about the entire life cycle of every material uh, if we could go on to the next slide so low carbon in practice um, what i thought was a, a nice way of demonstrating this was actually to use two examples of products uh, projects that we're currently got um, on site uh, and in design and what we want to do was actually show obviously where we are with comparing these against uh, the, the Letty standards at this moment in time. And what this shows is that obviously the, the, uh, the first project, which was uh, Kingsbrook Farm, uh, this, is based, um, this is based on a, a SIPS uh, panelling system. So the entire um, fabric of the building is effectively a timber cassette solution uh, with a brick outer skin. Um, and what that's been able to do is obviously it's got a, a high element of embodied carbon um, but it also has a lot of low energy uh, features in this building and what that's meant is that from an energy in use product, uh, perspective we've been able to be underneath the Letty advice for this type of like this type of building and again it's all these small changes so one of the things that we're seeing obviously was the the, the envelope uh, and what we were able to do there are improvements over part L, but they perhaps weren't enough. So what we did was with the next project, which was a Glebe Farm, which is a project in Milton Keynes, uh, we started right from the very start thinking about exactly what we could do uh, with the envelope. And so what we've ended up with is a U value of 0.12, which is obviously significantly better uh, than current part L. And these are the things that collectively construction as, a, as an industry has got to start moving towards um, and actually looking at the, the right way. So uh, interestingly on this one, uh, we're currently reviewing uh, panelized solutions that are built off site um, and will be delivered to site and obviously that speeds up, but it also has an element of embodied carbon. But we're also looking at what the impact is of actually delivering those on site and how that looks like from an overall life cycle uh, material basis. The good thing with the uh, Glebe Farm School, uh, this, uh, like many projects these days, uh, is completely fossil fuel free. So they, they're not even using gas for their Bunsen burners in their science classrooms, it's all electric, uh, electric air source heat pumps, electric cooking. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's working with uh, the, our clients and, and mainstream budgets, uh, and this is done on a mainstream DFE budget um, to achieve these. Um, so that effectively the future can be start to realize now. Um, and the one thing that, you know, we, we hope that um, people take from this is that, you know, there are, there are improvements that we're doing now, 
there's some very clear elements, as you'll see from the comparisons, that need working on. And we're hoping that the next generation of design managers and product developers and students that are currently perhaps sat at a desk somewhere will take this, develop these elements. Uh, you know, lighting, glass, all those things need to start being developed so that we can be, we've got the right product to take us forwards. Uh, and I hope that obviously this brief presentation uh, will, will inspire some, some of those next designers and innovators to take up the challenge and we'll get to uh, zero carbon a lot quicker than 2050. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, James. Um, again, time's always against us, James, but a, a, quick, a quick question. Um, you obviously have been doing incremental steps and then bigger steps to um, achieve your targets. It's a continuous process. Obviously on the last example at Glebe Farm, are you finding that your clients um, are very open to having the sort of approach that you're taking um, or are you having to persuade them that's the route to go? Well, one of the things we've started doing is actually developing very early with clients a, a, a sustainability matrix. So we've developed our own sustainability matrix. And what we're actually showing clients nowadays is actually the benefits. Um, and it's not just a case of throwing money at it. We want to, you know, so that they don't increase their budgets. And what we're actually selling is the entire life cycle. And what we've been able to do by improving the thermal and envelope benefits is, is actually show them how we're reducing their ongoing operational costs of their buildings. And from that benefit, they can see why actually investing in the right products now for their new buildings is the right solution and we are finding more and more clients are open to this and they're more and more engaging with us uh, when we do so. Thank you a lot. I'll pass you back to, to, to Pauline. Okay, so our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is Richard Davidson. Richard is a director at um, Wilma Dixon um, he's responsible for the, all their business development, early tendering and, and market engagement. He's a strategic thinker and a believer, I know this, in constant improvement. He's um, very active and highly involved in a number of local and national initiatives and turning his holistic thinking and energy into whatever challenge is presented to him. So Richard, um, with approximately 29 million homes to be brought up to decent standards of efficiency, as we heard from Nigel, um, what challenges um, does that present in procurement and the supply chain? So over to you, Richard. Well, thank you very much, Pauline, for that. Uh, just let's get this slide up and running, shall we? So yes, that's a lovely present, uh, a lovely introduction, and um, it's been quite interesting listening to the other speakers um, um, progressively taking away some of the things I was going to talk about. But uh, never mind, we can, uh, we can add some extra layers in. So um, yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, there are 29 million homes that need to be brought up to a decent standard, and it was really interesting to hear in the very first presentation when Richard was talking about. Um, uh, policies and then someone raised a question about their home and I'm actually going to address that directly and I'm going to bring a very personal story into that as well. So um, let's have a few facts because I think this is always really useful for us. So 29 million homes in the UK uh, with 20% of the total UK carbon footprint. I actually checked this yesterday so there are some new stats out um, and the reason it's actually gone up in the last few years the emissions from our homes partly is because we're um, spending more uh, energy on heating them, um, but also the energy sector, the energy producing sector is working really hard to bring down their carbon footprint. So um, whilst the UK's carbon emissions have fallen um, year on year, um, it's about, I think it's about 4% from the data from the uh, Office of National Statistics, um, our homes aren't getting much better. Um, it's really good to hear about Ilkley Homes and their uh, drive for new houses to meet that net zero challenge. And obviously, I know Morgan Sindel are doing the same. And we are, and, and I, I know the sector is trying really hard to work on these new build solutions. And there's a lot of technology and a lot of investment happening there. And I think what we've got to try and do is, is work out how to trickle that down into our existing homes. I think fascinatingly, of those 29 million homes, 80% are either privately owned or rented. And when we talk about privately owned, I think I found it was um, something like 
70% of those are people who own or occupy, so people like me, people like a lot of those on this call. Uh, Richard covered earlier about the EPC uh, rating C by 2035. My challenge would actually be is we should drive harder on that. Um, but I think really challenging for us is two thirds of the homes fail to meet that, that requirement. Um, I was involved in a seminar earlier this year, uh, someone from the uh, Department for Business and Energy talking about two thirds of our homes currently fail to meet that target and that the easy wins are mostly taken. So there was a big push seven, eight years ago for roof insulation, for double glazing, uh, low energy light bulbs, and actually all the easy wins are taken. And so now we've got the harder stuff to do. So we're talking about solid wall insulation. We're looking at from double glazing to triple glazing. We're looking at getting all of our boilers uh, improved. And I think the biggest challenge, if we're ever looking at solving a solution, let's go for the big hitter. And the big hitter in all our homes is the emissions. 80% of your emissions in home are from space and water heating. Your gas boiler, most people have got gas boilers, is your problem. So what can we do? So we've already covered a few areas earlier, talking about the uh, guidance and we're talking about funding. I was looking at this more from a technical solution. So Richard very briefly touched on PAS 2035. This is a series of standards that have been brought together by the sector, both from installers, from contractors, from investors, from the BRE, from manufacturers to find a framework that we can all work towards. And it's there, training is starting to be rolled out. This gives us something that we can all work with. PAS 2035 also, and Richard rightly pointed this out, talks about having someone to come and inspect your home, give you guidance on how to improve it, and then to have an overseeing role. So you might call this a clerk of works type role at that point, and prior to that, maybe a, a lead designer. Uh, we've got passive house benefit, which is something I've been looking into in my own home. Again, this is a good standard. We can trust it. it gives us some pretty difficult challenges, but does drive us to that low carbon emissions. I think one of the areas that, that maybe is missed is that we do have componentry. We already have solutions to the problems. So we can talk about solid wall insulation. I used to live in a Victorian end of terrace, difficult solid walls, challenging to get any insulation on the outside of the building because I had part of all issues. Um, so we can do look at that, but then there are also full scale solutions, whole new roofs and facades, and there's uh, a an organization called Energy Spring, I think I've got that right, that's come over from Holland, and they will look at how to basically put a new wall and a new roof on your house in a manner of days. And I would argue that we already have the installers and the suppliers in the system. So when we talked about the challenge for the supply chain, it, I think we have something. I'm just not sure we're accessing it in the right way. And I think the last point I wanted to say is we have plenty of case studies. If you look they are there. And I know we're a business in a sector that likes to make sure we've got evidence before we push forward at grand scale. Well, the information is there. Let's use it and let's do something with it. Now, the biggest challenge for us is identifying those hurdles and breaking them or jumping over them. And I think the first one to address is about consumer demand and confidence in the sector. It doesn't help that we have, as in any sector, people who uh, like to take advantage uh, of challenges. I think what we have to look at is somehow the sector is making sure that people have the confidence that we can deliver and it's good quality and it does exactly what it says on the tin. One of the things that we talked about with Ilka Homes there was a visible pipeline. They're, they are now having to create their own pipeline because it's very difficult to understand where the next job is going to come from, who's going to invest in new factories and new products if they don't know who's going to buy it. And I think one of the areas we could look at is cooperatives. So as a homeowner, it would be much cheaper for me if I was able to do that with my neighbour, if I was able to do that with others on my street. There are, there are some small scale opportunities out there. I think maybe we have to look at how we can promote those. Incentivization. One of the uh, points raised right at the beginning was around, uh, I can't afford to do this. So we have to think clearly about, well, What's the other incentive? And I'm going to propose a solution to that in a minute. We have this balance between what's cost and affordability and profitability. I would argue that we have to consider that this isn't just about day one or year one cost, but this is about a 20 year plan. I intend to stay in the house I live in now for 20 years. So actually maybe I should look at that 20 to 30,000 pound investment 
as a 20 year investment, not a year one investment. Um, I'm conscious of time. So let's just think about procurement routes. There are plenty of options. I think we will start to look more at alliancing contracts. And I think when it comes to procurement routes, we have to look at evidence based in terms of outcomes. And then I just come back to the trust in the sector. Can we overcome the hurdles? Of course we can. We can solve anything. If COVID-19 has taught us one thing is that when there's a big challenge, we can rise to it. But I do think we need some big things to get us over that. And the one controversial point I wanted to book at the very top is I believe that our government should take a bolder step and link our council and property tax to the carbon emissions. We do it for vehicles, which generate 33% of all our carbon emissions in the UK. I don't understand why we're not starting to look at that with our houses. The polluter pays. We've had the Environmental Protection Act since 1990, which talks about polluters paying for the damage. Our houses are causing damage to the environment. There should be a different tax regime. That's uncomfortable. People don't like me doing it. And if we were in a room, you'd throw tomatoes at me. But it's a fact. The government needs to look at grant funding. And Richard earlier talked about that it's running out. And we need to create pipelines. What stops it working? And I've just realized I've run out of time. So it's our human behavior, the year one against year 20. I think we're too lost in waiting for the perfect solution. And I think what we need to look for is just get on and do something. So the other two things here is we need to keep lobbying our politicians, tell them this makes a difference. A year ago, Greta Thunberg was encouraging us all to stop going to school and stop going to work. We've kind of put that on pause. We need to keep lobbying the politicians for those uncomfortable things I talked about. And the last thing is to look at our own homes. So right now I am looking at my own home. I'm looking at the solution I can. Um, uh, sorry, same detached house. which is expensive because the second one is overcoming putting it apart and looking at a net zero solution. I'm going to make that work time I can tell you exactly how so I'm thinking of the future, I'm thinking of my children. My house is a polluter, I need to fix it. Thank you. Thank you so much Richard. Over to Steve. I think there is um, a little bit of um, noise on the line, or it's my um, uh, line, I'm not sure. A quick question for you, Richard, if you're still there. Is our, um, let's come up here on the chat. Is are there sufficient installers and suppliers to retrofit homes at the quality, the speed and scale required? What's your view on that? Yes, there are, because the demand at the moment is fairly low. What I would look at is considering the domestic new build housing scene. There are plenty of people out there who are already able to install insulation, install windows, install roofs. There are plenty of manufacturers of these products. Turning their attention to our houses isn't difficult. The demand is low, so we don't have enough specialists. If you had a pipeline, which I know local authorities look at and social housing providers do, then you know, I live in St Albans, more than similar rolling that out and hands off, hand, hats off to them for making it work. So yes, it can. And, and I guess if the demand changes and increases, then the suppliers will come into the market. Um, more. Yeah. Um, so, okay, no, that's um, really helpful. Um, I'm back to Pauline. Thank you. Thank you, and th thank you Richard. Our last, um, but certainly not um, forgetful gentleman, is Robert Ills. He's the lead researcher um, for BRE, but working on the Construction Innovation Hub project. Now, Robert has had a great number of roles which really add to um, what he's doing now. He's worked as a physics teacher, he's been a technical director and a technical author. He has a PhD in physics education and a special interest in how attitudes can be changed to create a vibrant, diverse and sustainable industry. And so today, I introduce to you Robert, who is going to discuss the path to net zero, how our built environment is set to be transformed. Robert, over to you. Thank you very much, Pauline. Um, thank you for that um, introduction. Um, I think we're really in um, good company today um, from some of the case studies and stories that we've heard from the other speakers. I'm just trying to get my um, screen shared while um, while I'm talking. Um, I'm going to add to the story 
uh, by telling you a little bit about how um, some of the innovations that are occurring um, through the project um, on the um, government's industrial strategy, in particular transforming construction challenge, how some of those innovations can actually further us along the path to net zero. So back in 2013, um, the government published um, paper construction 2025, and it set out bold ambitions um, to lower project costs, um, improve schedule, lower emissions and improve exports. Um, at the time, and this was reported a couple of years later by Mark Farmer's reports, at the time, and arguably, you know, it is still the state today, the industry was in a dire state with some really depressing statistics. Um, some of our other speakers today have um, quoted carbon emission figures, but I'll quote a few others. For example, 47% of all man hours in the industry are wasted. So just think about that. Half of your working waste is, is typically wasted. Um, another one that came to mind is that um, it could be anything up to 5% of your project cost could be spent in dealing with waste. And think about that if you're spending millions or billions on, on a project. Uh, that's, that's something that's absolutely, um, you know, um, mind boggling. If we fast forward to the current, um, you'll see recent headlines, for the example, the likes of MACE, who've committed to net zero in 2020. Um, and another headline that, that caught my eye as well, the innovative developer Project Etopia have actually signed up to um, the carbon credit scheme this year. But if we go back to say, looking at those 2025 um, figures, is there any actual hard evidence for it today? Um, about a paper that was passed in McKinsey 2019 modular construction from projects from projects to products. Um, I've got a couple of screenshots pulled up there and interestingly um, they did a meta-analysis of, of a large number of projects and they've actually demonstrated that um, it is possible to improve your schedule from 20 to 50 percent. It's actually it's actually possible to improve your cost um, by anything up to about 20 percent. So um, Changing tax a little bit, what am I doing? So I'm lead researcher for skills and training on the Construction Innovation Hub. As Pauline mentioned, I have a very strong interest in sort of attitudinal shift. How can, how can we really start believing in all of this stuff? Um, so the Construction Innovation Hub um, is, is part of the industrial um, strategy, part of the transforming construction challenges I mentioned. Um, I'm gonna tell you in, the, in my remaining time about two of our projects. Um, and about some of the things we're doing on those projects and how they can actually further us along the path to net zero. First project I'd like to talk about is our platform approach. So what do we mean by that? Um, now I'm a firm of a believer in offsite and as I said, we've got some, we had some great representation from the sector um, amongst the speakers today. Um, but I'm gonna be slightly presumptuous and say that um, I think a platform approach could be the next evolution of offsite approaches. So it's going to leverage all the great benefits of offsite um, and possibly more. So platform, what, what, what do we mean? So if, if, if you've got a building or a project where you really want to define some high value outcomes, um, what you've got is a rule book that will set out sizes, spans, interfaces, what's allowed for planning and building regs. Your platform will comprise a kit of parts, a limited kit of parts, I should say, um, that can actually fit together and give you a quite a wide range of different um, products. You'll likely have an online configurator. Now at the moment you can go onto BMW, you can go onto um, even Dulux and, um, and, and, even, and even hair colors as well. And you can go onto these online platforms and actually start configurating it and creating your products. Um, so through all of that is digitization and a golden thread of information. It's become a bit of a buzzword, um, but, but I, I still think it's, it's a good one. Um, and the, the aim is that you've got a digital twin, which is an in, in enhanced dynamic digital representation of a physical thing. Now, um, for my picture in the top, in, in the bottom right, um, which is Bryden Wood picture that I pulled up of, of an airport job that they were doing, you might think that a platform approach is um, only for those who've, who are very high tech. Um, it's expensive. It could quite possibly be very hydrocarbon heavy. Um, our home speaker today was saying you know, one, one of the key blockers to um, adopting offsite per se is you know that there's a very um, heavy upfront cost there. 
um, and that, that may well be the case. But the, the picture above it, I just want to leave, leave a thought in your mind that, you know, if, if in a platform you've got a set of rules and a set of interface points, why could it not be possible that even a straw bale solution components there could fit into your platform solution? Um, that, in that case, there, that, that was a picture that I got from a Lithuanian straw bale modular provider. So how is this all relevant to net zero? Well, firstly, lean, 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 um, you are really improving your processes. Um, you're improving productivity. You're applying Kaizen, like, like has been said today. You can really reduce waste. Um, some of the most um, impressive construction sites that I've ever seen, and, and interestingly, when, when, when our friends Project Utopia were installing a house over at the BRE, um, there was no skip for the first two weeks there. And that, and that for me, that, that was really impressive there. The house, the house got up to second level within a couple of days and no skip. Um, but also the benefits of a platform, you're really opening up the supply chain. If, if you've got a fixed number of parts um, and they're all constant, you, you, as I said, you open up the supply chain, um, you can create a stable pipeline of um, work through that approach. Second project I'd like to talk about is the Hubs Value Toolkit, which um, launched um, actually last month. Um, so what we're, what we're aiming to do there is as follows. The Value Toolkit is rooted in the three pillars of sustainability. And what we're proposing is that um, projects are measured using a five capitals approach, five capitals being human capital, natural, manufactured, uh, uh, financial and social. And what, we, what we're aiming to do is um, we're working with industry to agree on what the metrics are to sit under those capitals. Each project will have a unique value profile. Each client will have its own ideas about what it actually wants to value. How's, how might that be relevant to net zero? Well, you know, it's encouraging us to think beyond money. It's really encouraging us to define where our sense of value is and move it away from that into the more social areas, human areas and natural areas. And it's also about transforming business models, encouraging collaborative approaches, as others have touched on today, sharing risk and typically not hammering the contractor. So just as some closing thoughts, I've put up a few questions there. Um, the first one, to an extent, that's part of my job over the next couple of years to answer. And I would really love to come back in a year's time and say yes to that, that we do have the capabilities, competences and capacity to actually apply some of these innovations, demonstrate them and get them out there. Um, but I think there's, a, there's an absolute vast amount of work to do that. Second question, do we have the appetite? And, and, and as Pauline said at the beginning, that's something that's really of concern to me. And, and um, there's been a number of reports published recently, one by the Habar government discovery and another one by the government itself saying that they're admitting that there is a real need for um, people in government leadership and industry leadership to upskill themselves um, in order to um, really um, know about the, some modern innovative approaches. The third point, what do we actually need to do to do that? Um, I'm going to sort of talk about my which is training education. Um, Offsite Ready project, um, which was uh, funded by the CITB, had launched recently, and that's provided a whole wealth of um, new free training in offsite approaches that actually has just hit the Supply Chain Sustainability School under the name of Offsite for Everyone. So I'd encourage you to look out for that. Um, there's some free training there. But I think there's still a long way to go before it gets um, kind of embedded into, especially in terms of de developing standards so that it can be um, embedded in the FE sector. Just my final thing I've put at the bottom there, um, even if you don't believe in carbon credits, and I'm not gonna open up that can of worms at this point, um, I still think it's prudent to measure what we do, like McKinsey have done, our speakers are doing on their on their own projects, you know, to to, me, to, to measure everything and, and if possible to share that. I still think it's obviously prudent to reduce our emissions, and it's also prudent to compensate as well. And part of the compensation might be to really change what you think about in terms of what you actually value. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, you you touch on uh, at the very end, really, the whole skills agenda as well. Um, and I know you say it's probably too early to even um, identify, but you did touch on it as well, and you are identifying those skills. Do you, in terms of priorities, in terms of new skills, do you have a sense over the next year what those priorities are 
um, and where they lie, whether it's in, the leadership, in leadership, in in the supply chain, uh, on site. Do you, do you have a sense of, of those priorities in terms of skills? Yeah. Yes, Stephen, I think that's an absolutely excellent question. Um, first answer to it, I think the priorities are everywhere. There needs to be attacks on multiple fronts, so it needs, it needs to be happening in schools. We need to attract people into the industry. We need to, we need to, we need to embed um, off-site innovative approaches into FE. We need to do it in universities, as, as you've been doing yourself on, with your new construction management course. Um, but I'm going to actually choose um, leadership and practicing professionals as an area, certainly that we're targeting on the hub. We, we feel that that's an area of maximum impact in, in terms of actually upskilling, especially the leadership so that um, clients are kind of empowered to um, know about innovations and to really think about um, defining um, value drivers for their projects. Uh, thank you. Um, Robert, uh, that's really um, appreciated to conclude that. Um, Pauline, I didn't know if you wanted to come in here or shall I just um, share my screen and conclude? I think in the absence of Pauline, I'll share my screen and conclude. Um, if you just bear with me. Whilst I'm waiting to um, share my screen, can I just firstly um, thank um, all the presenters um, today? Um, I think when you talk about leadership, you um, epitomize um, the leadership is there. Um, some people say the industry is lagging behind what's required. I think there's some really powerful thought leaders, technological experts, people driving this change. And it's, um, I feel quite privileged to have um, such key people speaking um, today. Um, I just wanted to quickly um, summarize in terms of the issue around skills, picking up on what Robert said um, um, a moment ago. Um, at the University Campus St Albans, um, we've been trying to um, model a collaborative approach, both with the university, with the college, with other providers like Together Training. We're trying to provide an approach where we join people together to help support industry and to work with industry and to be industry facing. Um, I think for too long, um, we have um, tried to sell um, skills products without understanding what industry actually wants. Um, I'm going to move my slide on. Um, I, I'm conscious of the fact that actually what we need to do is build partnerships. I think we're stronger together. I know it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a hackneyed saying now, but we are stronger together. And given the sort of ideas that lie behind um, speakers talking today, working with um, industry, working with professional bodies, um, educational uh, providers, we've been trying to do that at University Campus St Albans. Um, and for us, the, the next opportunity to try and embed some of the thinking that's going on out there is the new degree apprenticeship uh, for construction management site management which we're launching in January 2020 and I just thought I would quickly um, cover some of that for our participants who might know people who might be interested um, we are um, having validation um, this November we have a very professionally engaged a team who are largely working in the industry um, and um, are actually very committed to this um, agenda that we're talking about today. It's a CIOB accredited program, and there is going to be a route to CIOB chartership. And it's funded by the levy. This is an opportunity for the employers to have, their, have the learning funded, um, fully funded, um, to enable um, them to develop their own staff. Um, and the program that we're developing will last um, just under three years. Um, in this program, at the heart of it, are some of the things we've been talking about today. We've developed a new module on off-site construction under modern methods of construction. We have a big thrust around sustainability, but also about new technologies. Uh, so uh, within that, looking at things like commercial management and project management, we're trying to bring in the whole sustainability agenda, looking at how new technologies can actually um, reduce emissions and improve the whole construction process. And, and uh, placing within the new program, the offsite um, construction um, as a new module. And we're hoping to use some of the free material that's been developed by others to help support the learning. But we think it's important that we're developing different sets of skills for construction site managers who need to be adaptable and flexible to respond to these new challenges. So in, in summary, 
because um, I'm very conscious of time, that we um, have created or are creating University of Hertfordshire Honours Degree. Um, it's a forward thinking curriculum. I think universities often uh, um, are reacting or taking long, uh, too long to change. And we want to create a curriculum that can respond to these challenges um, quickly and responsibly. Uh, it will be a CI or be accredited. And we want to give an experience for learners that is personalized. Um, so it's, um, it's smaller group learning and a sort, of, uh, 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 a sort of motto of being a person rather than a number. We, we create a, a very personalized learning journey for people um, with industry um, connected staff um, with, a, char um, with a, a pathway to chartership. Our current students on the degree are, are completing their MCIOB um, and have succeeded. Um, um, and we've had some stupendous results as a, res as a result of our program. Um, and we see our learning as transformational. Uh, but most importantly, I think what we're trying to do is to work with industry to invest in our future leaders. Um, Robert mentioned at the very end, and it's been alluded to earlier, that leadership is essential here. Um, and actually we need to invest in our future leaders, whether it be from school right through, but particularly at university education, we're trying to create um, site managers, project managers, who will be future leaders and play that role. Um, so um, there are more details here for, for contact details, but um, we're making huge progress on developing this degree apprenticeship. And um, even at this point, we are two thirds full um, for, for our January intake, which I'm delighted to say um, at this point. So I, I wanted to say, I'm gonna stop screen sharing, I think at this point, I just wanted to say thank you ever so much for um, participating um, and thank you for the, the um, contributors today. And there is a recording of the, um, the sessions and we will supply that recording um, to all people who participated and joined us today. So I think without further ado, I will um, bring uh, an end to the call and I will stop the recording. So um, unless Pauline wanted to come in. Yes, if I, I could, um, yeah, I, I just would like to reiterate what Stephen said. Thank you so much um, to everyone for attending, for all your comments throughout this um, engagement this morning and to our speakers who are carrying out some fundamental work. It is indeed um, absolutely paramount. Climate change in the built environment has to um, be addressed further and we are all advocates in championing that. So a big thank you. Um, we will be doing more of these and this is an ongoing conversation um, so please um, hope we can speak soon and carry on this so thank you all so much thank you bye bye